Welcome everyone. Um, today's Translational Science Seminar uh, features Dr. Nina Laharat Naharun, who's the Director of Penn State Decision Neuroscience Lab and Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Biobehavioral Health. Her interdisciplinary research program uses computational modeling, behavioral economics, and functional neuroimaging, fMRI, and EEG to understand the neural and behavioral mechanisms of social decision-making under uncertainty. The goal of Dr. Laharat Naharun's research is to exploit theoretically grounded behavioral and neurobiological signals for the design of algorithmic solutions that improve social decision-making in real-world environments. At Penn State, she is a, also a faculty member of the Center for Neuroengineering, as well as the Center for Brain, Behavior, and Cognition that is focusing on building interdisciplinary connections across the life, social, neural, and computational sciences. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and so today I'm going to talk all about um, risk signals in the brain um, and how we quantify risk in the brain and how we use these signals to estimate risky behavior in the lab. And then also how these signals might be related to translating them to more real world um, contexts. So before I get started, I just wanna introduce some of the research areas in my lab group and what we're kind of diving into these days. Um, so in my lab, our goal is really to focus on human decision-making processes at the biological, um, cognitive and behavioral levels um, with the goal of translating this information for cognitive neuroengineering solutions for improving health. Um, and we use a variety of tools to do this, as you'll see um, throughout this presentation. Um, our three current research areas are focused on um, really understanding the neural and communication dynamics of group behavior and their effects on decision making and performance. Um, you know, understanding social risk and those uh, computations that the brain makes um, to process social risk information um, that give rise to health risk perceptions and understanding um, how we make decisions or risky decisions um, in social different social contexts um, using real world neuroimaging techniques. Okay, so um, one period that is really important for studying risky behavior, um, risky behavior obviously occurs across the lifespan and is a really important problem, but adolescence is a particular um, period during which, uh, oops, um, is a risky period of development. And according to the 2021 um, US Census um, Bureau estimates, um, there were approximately 43 million youth um, in the adolescence age range in the United States, accounting for about 13% of the total US population. Um, there are 1.3 billion adolescents in the world today, more than ever. Um, and so this is really um, affects, this risky period of development affects a large proportion of the population. Um, and although adolescents are physically strong um, and healthy, their rates of injury and death actually increase about 200% from childhood to adulthood. Um, so as you can see here, 70% of adolescent deaths in the U.S. are attributable to preventable causes that actually result from engaging in risky behaviors such as substance use, um, violence, reckless behaviors, um, risky sexual behaviors, um, and things like that. Also, I think it's important to note that 50% of all adult psychiatric disorders actually begin in adolescence, um, and what's the statistic is um, what was, I guess, like staggering to me is that treatment doesn't begin until six to 23 years later. Um, so this is a really good um, period of development to study risky behaviors. Um, and it also signifies the that investing in a safe and healthy and productive transition from childhood um, to adulthood is really critical. So um, one of the th things that we do in my lab is really to 
understand what are the computations or these risk computations that are happening in the brain that give rise to these risky behaviors. And um, we do this by studying decision-making processes um, from a value-based decision-making approach that decomposes the decision-making process into different phases. So first, um, we have to represent the decision-making problem. Um, so what are the actions that I can take? Then we assign values to those different options um, under consideration. Um, and then we make choices after we assign values, likely selecting the option that had the highest value to us. And those values in, incorporate subjective values, you know, things that are important to us at an individual level. And then we evaluate um, the outcomes um, of our choices um, and see whether or not that was a good choice or not. And then, you know, learning happens. So if that was, if I got really good um, consequences or really good outcomes from making a specific selection, um, then I'm likely to do that in the future. And what's really nice about decomposing the decision-making process into these different phases are that, you um, there are separable, these are separable phases of the decision-making process, and these are computationally distinct processes, and it makes it tractable for studying how the brain makes decisions because these processes are actually reflected in separable brain networks. Um, so in this figure, you'll see um, that the representation of decisions actually involves both bottom-up processing um, from sensory cortices, such as the primary visual cortex, somatosensory cortices, but it also involves top-down processing from cortical areas, um, such as the orbitofrontal cortex and subcortical motivational brain circuitry, including the ventral striatum and the amygdala. Um, and the valuation process really integrates um, all of these inputs or incoming information um, into a common value representation that is represented um, in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So when we value something, um, our ventromedial prefrontal cortex um, is activated um, and responds to these things that we value in our environment, whether that be social praise, rewards, monetary rewards, food, um, and this has been shown in a variety of studies. Um, so this value-based framework is really nice for understanding and decomposing um, the neural computations that are associated with different phases of the decision-making process. I also want to point out that um, a lot of the adolescent risky decision-making literature has really focused on reward processing. Um, and really that is focused on outcome evaluation. So after you've already made the decision, um, adolescents have um, heightened sensitivity to rewards and they have um, heightened activation of the ventral striatum and other reward related circuitry. However, I wanna point out that that while this research is really important, there's a lot of um, mixed results in whether or not those brain signals um, during this outcome evaluation area or segment of the decision-making phase is actually related to real-world behaviors. And so in my lab, what we're really focused on is this valuation piece, because this is prior to when um, adolescents are making those risky choices. And so figuring out what drives um, individual subjective values um, in is helpful for predicting what choices they make and also important for um, targets for treatment and prevention and intervention efforts. Um, okay, so um, one of, I'm gonna give you an example here of how we study this in the lab. So we quantify risk as a modulator of value within this value-based decision-making framework. And we give participants two different options um, where they make multiple decisions. So this is just an example of one decision that um, an adolescent might make within our um, experimental paradigm. So they are given a choice between a red gamble and a blue gamble, where the red gamble, um, there's a 100% chance of earning um, $1 and a 50-50 chance of earning $3 or nothing at all. And so 
what would you all choose? Um, here in the um, audience, you can um, use the reactions. Um, you for So who would select the red gamble? You can do a thumbs up. No one would select the red gamble. Okay. If who there was only select? one. Could if do there was only one. one. Um, so between these two, and who would select the blue gamble? Okay, great. So we have a couple of responses here. Um, and in large groups of people, you can actually imagine um, there's actually a lot of variability in um, what choices people make in this, in you know, in this situation. Um, so, so we can actually quantify um, risk and reward within these different types of gambles or options, and the risk in the red gamble is pretty simple, right? There's zero risk. You have a 100% chance of earning that dollar. Um, risk can be quantified for the um, blue gamble as 0.75. So there's more risk in the blue gamble than the red gamble. And you could probably see that, but we can actually quantify that. And that's important for when we want to try and model some of these individual differences. Um, so how do we define subjective value? Subjective value, we use um, expected utility um, from economics, um, from an economic framework to quantify subjective value in this context. And subjective value is equal to the probability times the value of these options, the value meaning $3 or zero and the probability being 50% or 100%. Um, and the alpha here um, is our modulator of value, which is how we quantify those individual differences in risk. So we mostly chose the 50-50 gamble um, here. And what you can see is we can use this framework to actually quantify um, risk preferences. Um, so someone with an alpha of one would be risk neutral, um, where they see objective information as is. So their value of $3 um, in this blue gamble is $3. Someone who makes decisions with an alpha of less than one, um, they actually value that $3 as if it's 1.7, um, showing that they're risk averse. So they actually are transforming that um, value information or making choices as if $3 was $1.7. Um, and then someone who is risk-seeking with an alpha of greater than one um, would make choices as if that $3 was actually more than $3, that it was $5.20. Um, so this is a really nice tractable framework and quantitative framework for estimating these individual preferences. So one of the things that um, we've been trying to do in the lab is to try and really understand how risk is processed in the adolescent brain and whether or not it differs from adults, right? Um, and so how do adolescents process risk? So we conducted a um, longitudinal study um, where adolescents um, came into the lab at three um, each year for three years. Um, and 13, they were 13 to 14, 14 to 15 the second year, and then 15 to 16 this, the third year. And this is the same set of adolescents. Um, and then we had them do a decision-making task where they did about 144 trials of this game. So we had lots of different values, lots of different probabilities, and they're making these choices. And then we're using this um, subjective value model to basically estimate what their risk preferences are from their decisions that they make, which is very different than what um, than what other sort of measures of risk preference or risk sensitivity do in the literature, um, where we're relying on self-report information from these adolescents. Um, and so what we find um, from these um, adolescents in this study, this is about 169 adolescents, is that there are two different um, parameters that we can estimate from these choices. One is behavioral risk sensitivity, which I've just talked about. And as you can see across these three waves, adolescents actually become more risk averse over time. When you look at reward sensitivity, um, so this is the expected value associated with each of these options, you actually see a different trend where um, at, 
adolescents become more reward seeking over time. So as they age, um, those high valued outcomes are actually become more important. And so um, these potentially are two different um, processes and have been shown in a large body of literature in adults um, and adolescents that these two parameters actually contribute to risky choices. So what do we see in the brain? Um, so how do adolescent brains actually process risk information? And so we had a hypothesis that adolescents could process risk information in a similar way to adults. Um, adults, adolescents might not exhibit any processing of risk information, and maybe that's why they make such risky choices um, relative to, ad and adults have this representation, but maybe adolescents haven't developed it yet. Um, or adolescents might use different brain networks because their brain is undergoing significant uh, maturation, both structurally and functionally at this time window. Maybe adolescents are um, processing risk information in a different um, set of brain areas relative to adults that might be, give rise to these um, health risk behaviors. So what we did was we looked at um, those estimates or coefficient of variation estimates for risk, and we used that as a parametric modulator um, during our decision-making um, phase. And we correlated that with these bold responses from um, MRI scanning and we actually see that um, adolescents actually represent in risk information in the medial prefrontal cortex, um, anterior cingulate cortex, um, the insular, bilateral insular cortices, and the ventral stratum. This is not different than um, what we see in adults, which is in this black box here. Um, and so really adolescents and adults represent risk information in very similar ways. Um, so one of the things that we were really interested in is a lot of the literature that is focused on adolescent risky decision-making focuses on how they represent risk information or reward information, but rarely do they link it to actual health risk behaviors. So one of the first things that we did was to see whether or not the risk preferences that I just talked about, these behavioral estimates that we get from our computational models, whether or not that's correlated with this risk-related um, brain activity that we saw in the previous slide. In fact, we do see that if adolescents are more risk averse, that they actually recruit um, this risk-related brain, brain network so adolescents that are risk averse have greater signaling um, or greater activation or recruitment of activation in the medial prefrontal cortex, bilateral insular cortices, and ventral striatum. So they are using this value-based network um, to inform their choices. And so we are interested in looking at, um, and we did this for each of these brain areas um, separately, and what we found was that right insular activation um, at time one in this longitudinal study, um, not the medial prefrontal cortex, cortex or anterior cingulate cortex or the ventral striatum was actually related to the change in health risk behaviors from wave one to wave three. So if you remember, um, these adolescents are 13 to 14 at age um, at wave one. And at wave three, they're about 15 to 16, which is at which is when the period, um, which is when they're supposedly in the literature to experience um, heightened risk, um, risky behaviors. And so what we see is that adolescents who have decreased insular um, activation um, or decreased risk processing in their brains at time one actually have the greatest increase in their change in health risk behaviors from wave one to wave three using a latent growth curve modeling that also includes 
um, reward sensitivity and risk sen behavioral risk sensitivity estimates. So this is over and above reward sensitivity. It seems that risk um, sensitivity in the insular cortex is related to a change or predictive of this change in health risk behaviors from wave one to wave three, which is really important given that a large majority of the research currently in adolescent risky decision-making has focused on reward processing and reward-related brain activation. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about um, how we've modified this model to actually study um, what what other parameters in an adolescent's subjective valuation model that they might use um, that may explain why they might be more likely to engage in risk-taking. So in the um, previous slides, I mentioned that subjective value was equal to the probability times value, where risk preferences were modulators of value. But just like we can have biases in how we perceive value or rewards, such as the $3 or $0, we can also experience biases in probabilities as well. And this is not a new concept, um, but um, so Kahneman and Tversky um, and uh, Richard Gonzalez um, and George Wu have both um, studied this and found that humans do exhibit probability biases. Um, in the in in fact, there's we ha see this nonlinear sort of probability weighting function where um, people tend to overestimate um, sort of smaller. Um, probabilities and underestimate larger probabilities. But what was really interesting um, that Richard Gonzalez um, and George Wu proposed was also in this function of probability biases, there's also this attractiveness of a gamble, which is um, parameterized as the intercept of this function. So people are likely to treat all probabilities as higher or lower than they are. Um, which is what the intercept represents. And that idea is very similar to what we see in the psychology literature of optimism and pessimism bias. And so optimism, optimism and pessimism bias in the literature has been shown in adolescence um, to be related to health risk perceptions and also health risk um, behaviors. Um, so those who show optimistic biases um, show that they're they show a bias in their actual probabilities relative to the perceived probabilities. And adolescents who are pessimistic about their future um, were actually more likely to take risks um, with their health um, and safety. So it could be either way. So how could we take this information and actually put it into a, quanta, um, a, a mathematical model? So we can model probability biases um, similar for this um, blue gamble as optimists or pessimists, where um, optimists would perceive that they're, let's say, instead of um, $3, it's $3 million, right? Um, we would have a 70% chance of earning $3 million rather than a 50% chance. Um, and those who are pessimists might think that there's a 30% um, chance of earning $3 million rather than um, 50%, which is lower than 50%. So they underestimate um, their likelihood of earning the high valued outcomes. And so we can actually compute both of these parameters within the same model, risk attitudes and probability biases, to estimate an individual's probability bias and their risk attitudes in this decision-making paradigm. And so in, um, so what, what I've shown, this is similar to the results that I showed before, and this is a separate sample of adolescents. It's 159 adolescents instead of 169, and we're only looking at one time point here. But you can see that um, greater risk aversion was related to bilateral um, activation of the insular cortices, which seemed to be really important for representing risk. And that probability bias um, 
actually was related to um, adolescents who were more pessimistic actually had an additional utility signal in the amygdala and parahippocampal gyrus. So what was really interesting about this um, about this result, which is really cool, um, is that these two parameters actually recruit separable brain areas, suggesting that they are actually separable constructs. Um, and so this is, um, we have risk attitudes and probability biases. Um, and then we also wanted to look at, okay, well, in, in a match, demographically matched um, control group of adults, to these adolescents, these were actually their parents, um, do we see the same sort of neural signaling um, for risk attitudes and probability bias? And what you can see here um, with the blue um, areas is these are the adolescents relative to the adults. You see um, some SMA activation, the medial prefrontal cortex and the bilateral um, parahippocampal gyrus and amygdala activation for probability bias, but you do not see that for the adults. So this, in the adults, we actually see greater inferior frontal gyrus activation and superior temporal gyrus um, activation, which are also involved in probability and encoding probability information and risk information. Um, but it seems that this signal that we're getting for probability bias seems to be specific to adolescents. So in our work, one of the things that's really important to us is really understanding whether or not these individual differences are related to some of these uh, real world uh, risky behaviors that adolescents are engaging in that you know are causing their um, premature mortality um, and morbidity. And so we use the child behavior checklist or Achenbach's um, child behavior checklist, and we looked at externalizing behaviors. So these ends, I wanna caution you here that this is representative of what we see in the general population in our sample. So we have a lot of adolescents who experience low risky behavior and a small proportion of our sample actually experienced high risky behavior according to um, these clinical ranges for these T-scores um, according to the child behavior checklist. And so what we see is that there's really risk attitudes or these individual differences in risk preferences don't actually dissociate kids that engage in high risky behavior, high levels of risky behavior, such as substance use, delinquency, reckless driving, um, from those adolescents that engage in low risky behavior. But what was really interesting to us is that we found that this probability bias parameter actually did distinguish between kids that were adolescents that were engaging in high levels of risky behavior versus low levels of risky behavior, um, and that these kids were actually more pessimistic. And this is really um, interesting as it's in line with um, the threshold impulsivity models of risky behavior, where adolescents maybe um, who engage in risky behavior may just not care because they think that they're likely to experience low outcomes all the time. Um, they could also be another hypothesis for why pessimism um, might be driving risky behavior could be that adolescents may um, try to use risky behavior to escape some of the internalizing symptoms that they are experiencing. So large amounts of negative emotion might be coped with um, by getting positive um, um, emotional responses from engaging in risky behavior. Those are just two hypotheses um, that obviously are post hoc, um, but maybe explanations for, for why we see this result. So um, now I'm just gonna touch briefly on something that our lab is super interested in because most of the risky decision-making literature in adolescents has focused on using non-social risk paradigms. But as we all know, when we engage in risky um, decision-making, risky decision-making actually occurs um, with other people. And other people can actually be um, 
the be the factors that determine whether or not um, whether or not we get the outcomes that we want. And so if this is a common example that I try to give folks um, where you know it's a surgical context and you can imagine that you have a human team of surgeons that are determining whether or not you live or successfully survive the surgery, or you have um, you know, a team of robots. Um, and individuals may have preferences for whether or not they prefer the robot team um, doing the surgery or versus this human team. And so we've incorporated this into, into our decision-making or experimental paradigm um, by having um, participants choose between keeping a certain amount of money or choosing to invest their money in a non-social um, probabilistic mechanism that determines their payouts or another person that actually determines their payouts. And so what we found is that common across both social and non-social contexts is that the right insular cortex, not surprisingly, as you've seen in um, a couple other studies, is related to um, processing risk information in both social and non-social contexts. But what is specific to social information relative to non-social information um, in this contrast is we find that the bilateral amygdala, the temporal parietal junction, which is important for social functioning and processing um, of theory of mind. So when you're thinking about what another person potentially might be thinking of um, or engaging in social interactions, the TPJ is very much involved in those social processing um, social processing of information and the medial prefrontal cortex. And so we find that these brain areas are specific to processing social risk information relative to non-social risk information. And what these results combined tell us is that we not only have similar brain regions that process risk, but that we have distinct brain regions that are processing social risk information separate from non-social risk information. Um, this also affects um, the reward phase. I'm going to skip this for time. Um, and so what we've learned is that risk information is actually processed by the insular cortex, cortex and may be important for guiding adolescents away from or toward taking risks. Um, the, these risk signals are related to health risk behaviors, that social risk information recruits a separate or distinct network of brain regions, including the temporal parietal junction in the amygdala, and that um, these are correlated with risk-related brain activation. So in terms of translating this to a real-world setting, um, we, when I was at the um, Army Research Laboratory, we conducted a real-world risky driving study where we gave um, participants the same task, these are adults, um, and we had them drive in a car um, while they had, um, we had EEG hyperscanning. So they were um, wearing EEG caps and ECG bio harnesses um, and also collecting their um, skin responses or EDA responses um, using the Empatica. And then we actually fully instrumented a Ford Fusion vehicle with um, all of these different sensors um, to measure things like following distance, braking, acceleration, deceleration, speeding, lane changes, um, so that we could get an objective measurement of real world risky driving. And so just to give you an idea of what this looked like, this is drone footage um, of the vehicle, of the driver and the passenger in the car. Um, there were several tasks that they actually did during um, this experiment. Um, they listened to podcasts. They did a, um, a memory task, um, but the drive took about an hour. And this is just an illustration of the engineering efforts um, done by um, my team at the Army Research Lab, where we developed um, this multimodal sensing environment within this vehicle to actually measure um, real-world risky driving on I-95. 
Okay, so we measured risky driving, um, looking at using a principal components analysis, and these are just some of the variables. Um, risky driving really loaded onto the first factor, and this was really just speed and the number of lane changes. Um, and we called the second factor aggressive driving. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to focus on risky driving, um, since one of the things we're really interested in is, can this laboratory task or this gambling task where people are making decisions and then we estimate what their risk preferences are, is that related to actual real world risky driving? And what we found was that, in fact, it is. Um, and what we found was interesting, where we found that drivers actually... Um, conformed to their passengers' risk preferences. So we found that greater driver risk aversion was related to reduced risky driving only when the passenger was also risk averse. Um, and the potential mechanism for this um, that we thought, well, how are these preferences are being um, measured before the drive? How are these actually being communicated to um, the driver during this risky driving um, protocol? And one of the things that we explored is we tried to measure neural synchrony. So I'm not, I'm going to skip this in the effort of time, but I'm happy to take questions about it later. Um, and so what we found here is that value-based, this value-based decision-making framework actually provides a tractable approach for identifying both neural and behavioral mechanisms of risky, risky choice. And that there are individual differences in risk preferences that guide how our brain actually processes risk information in social and non-social contexts. Um, and that people's um, preferences for risk, um, both at the neural and behavioral level, are related to real world behaviors. Um, so now our lab is currently studying um, social context at multiple levels and how social context affects the development of these risk signals in adolescence, um, both at a micro level within um, the child or the adolescence um, environment in the home um, and with their parents, and then also um, in their larger or greater social network. Um, and... I'm happy to talk about some of these clinical implications, which I'm sure that many of you might have questions on, and I'll just stop there and take questions. Thank you, that was really fabulous. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, if there's none right off the bat, I will just ask, in the dyads, uh, experiencing the risky driving, uh, mm -hmm. you you move quickly to neural synchrony. So are they in the same space? And you know, there's a lot of work, things that you could show us there, but it still had to be communicated somehow. Right. Uh, so right. do you think that that was verbal or nonverbal or some combination between the two, like a gasp and clutching the dashboard versus yeah. can you slow down or there must've these been are, some communication. Yeah. These are really, really interesting Um Interesting hypotheses. So one of the things that is nice about having all of these objective measurements in the vehicle is we have things like posture and we have post pressure sensors in the um, passenger and driver seat. Um, and so some preliminary data from that work has showed that um, there is synchrony and sort of behavioral movements um, between the driver and passenger. Um, we haven't looked at whether or not that's actually linked to um, some of these these risk preferences. But one of our hypotheses was that neural synchrony happens um, sort of non-verbally, right, um, is what you were getting at. And our hypothesis was that maybe there's some synchronization happening at a neural level between the driver and the passenger that it is communicating these risk preferences. And we actually do see um, that we do, I'm gonna go back to this slide. Um, we do see that um, the greater the difference in these risk preferences between the driver and the passenger, that that was related to greater neural synchrony in the gamma frequency band. The gamma frequency band is really, has been um, highlighted as a frequency that is important for social communication, specifically naturalistic social communication in representing another person's intention. And so 
this original, I, when we first saw this result, it was like super counterintuitive because we're like, well, why aren't we seeing greater, um, people who are more similar to one another have greater synchrony because that's typically how we think like, okay, if I'm similar to someone, then I should be more in synchronous with them. But our um, thoughts about the implications of this result might be that people are trying to engage, you know, become, they're trying to get on the same page as each other and maybe exerting more effort within this frequency band to actually bring these risk preferences um, closer together um, since we see this relationship, which is preliminary at this point, um, but that's our current hypothesis. So we think that it is being driven by sort of these nonverbal signals that we can study within this data set um, at multiple levels. So that's uh, really interesting. I would uh, just suggest maybe considering the communication, if you had audio or video of the people in the car to see just before your gamma synchronization signal, what was the communication and whether it was verbal or nonverbal. Uh, it was so fascinating. Uh, Jen has a question. Yes, thank you so much. What a fantastic presentation, really appreciate it. I was gonna follow along this um, example as well um, because I was curious about the differential between the folks. I can't tell from your picture, but I'm wondering too, if you're more likely to be tuned in on that gamma level, if you're a parent-child dyad or a, you know, a partner dyad versus if you're just friends. I'm wondering if you've looked at the relationship of individuals and how that impacts this effort. Yeah. So we have not yet in the lab. That is something that we're really um, looking forward to doing in future studies. In this study, these were all coworkers who worked for the same organization within the same space, but they did not, they had never driven together. So um, you can be colleagues and have, there were certain levels of familiarity. So within this result, um, in the model, we actually added a familiarity um, uh, measure and we also added their social network, um, social distance measure. Um, in, in risk preference in the entire network. So we calculated that and added that as a covariate in this model to account for familiarity um, because it could be that people who are more familiar with one another actually require less synchronization at this frequency band to actually get on the same page. So that would be the hypothesis between, I think, parents and children. Maybe I think we would see, my hypothesis would be that we would see more synchronization maybe with parents and children. And then at, as, as adolescents age, you actually see that, you know, increase and then maybe come back um, sort of as adolescents get older. Um, but that would be really interesting to study longitudinally. Yeah, that's exactly where my head was, because I'm pretty sure my daughter, my permitted daughter is not in synchrony with my risk aversion <laughs> while we're driving. Um, but but it does make sense, you know, co-workers, you could, you could argue they're they're in tune, they're trying to figure each other out. And yes, I think the parent-child relationship would be really fascinating for this, but it could also, where my head went, it could have implications beyond this, right? So it might help inform, like, how do you best talk to your child about substance use? How do you talk about risky sexual behaviors? You know, because if they're not, if they're not tuning in and trying to align, maybe there's better approaches. So I love this. I, I wondered um, kind of your future steps. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with the um, one of the things from the first study where we saw that there was like less this decreased signal of um, activation in the insular cortex that actually linked to, you know, more change in health risk behaviors over time. One of the potential implications of that result, I think, is how do we get these kids who might be more vulnerable or at risk for these um bad behaviors or maladaptive behaviors, um, how do we get them? Well, clearly we've identified them really early on and they hadn't even been doing those behaviors. So how do we get them to do less behaviors over time? And one um, clinical, I think, uh, suggestion might be to have parents actually verbalize what their decision-making process is as they are making these types of risky choices. I'm going out for a bike ride. I'm going to 
put on a helmet to protect my brain because my brain's a very important organ, you know, um, or putting on a seatbelt or I'm going to choose not to drink tonight, right, um, for whatever reasons. And so explaining those thought processes may help adolescents actually generate those connections and increase that risk signal. So that would be something that's something that we're interested in um, in studying in the lab um, in future studies. Thank you. Other questions? Nina, was there a part that you wanted to go back to? You mentioned some of the additional implications, clinical or otherwise. Yeah. I mean, I guess I could talk about, so um, one of the things that our group is currently doing is a lot of the risky decision-making literature has really focused on the individual um, but not the individual within the context of group behavior. Um, and so how do we look at risky decision-making as a group? Um, and what are group dynamics that might contribute to more risky behavior um, in group environments? Um, we also have seen that these social and non-social risk preferences, um, actually in some recent work, um, that was published recently, we found that these risk, social and non-social risk preferences were at, actually explain which individuals are likely to accept um, advice from technologies such as algorithms or um, virtual agents. And so one of the things that we're really interested in doing is actually using these, since these are quantitative models of the human, we're actually interested in developing um, closed loop systems in the form of algorithms or mobile applications that can actually estimate um, or predict what humans might, bad choices they might make and then make recommendations for those within um, these like more heterogeneous teams. Um, and then in terms of these clinical applications, I think for this work, I think this work has the potential of a lot of these tasks, or at least in psychiatry, I think we still rely a lot on self-report from parents and self-report on the youth. And I think that's really important. But some of these behavioral tasks that have these neural substrates um, can actually be transitioned to clinical settings to provide assessments or screenings of at-risk at youth and also provide targets for prevention and intervention efforts. Um, so we are trying to build more of these algorithms um, into um, mobile health applications where we can um, develop algorithmic recommendations to really optimize health choices. Um, and an area that we have started to focus on, but um, we only have behavioral data at this point, um, is you can give someone recommendations, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to incorporate that information into their choice. So how do we actually quantify that? And how does the brain, how does the adolescent brain or the adult brain actually incorporate that information into existing biases that where the information might challenge and not be um, confirming existing biases? It might actually be counter to what you think. Um, and what we've seen preliminarily in some of our behavioral studies is that adolescents are actually much more apt to incorporate information into their existing biases relative to adults, which is what you might expect, um, but that they um, don't incorporate all of it. They incorporate some of pieces of the information and that these are domain specific. So they are more likely to incorporate information for adaptive um, risk situations versus maladaptive and positive and versus negative outcomes. Um, so I think that's um, some of these clin clinical applications that might. For that, uh, yeah. For that taking advice from algorithms comment you made, did that uh, pan out as the high risk or the low risk group were more likely to take advice, including algorithms? So what we found was that it was actually whether or not you prefer, so in the social versus non-social risk um, conditions, 
people that were less likely to take risks in the social situation were more likely to take advice um, from, um, yeah, people who were, sorry, people who were more likely to take risks from social, um, in the social condition, were more likely to take advice from humans versus people who are more likely to take um risk who make risky choices or prefer taking risky choices in non-social situations they in our non-social condition that actually explained who was likely to take um advice from algorithms so we see that these individual differences in how people approach um risk information um into their individual difference preferences that that seems to explain their their choices in a variety of domains not just substance use but here we've in this talk I've shown substance use or health risk behaviors but also risky driving and this technology space so this seems to be a um, how we approach risk and uncertainty in the brain and behavior seem to guide um, our decisions in a, in a lot of domains, um, which is really interesting and exciting. Thank you. That was great. Uh, Dan has a question. How is executive functioning, for example, inattention, impulsivity related to risk? Does the association differ between social and non-social risk? That is a excellent question, Dan. And, um, so in terms of cognitive control and risk, we do have one study looking at the interaction between the neural correlates of cognitive control, um, specifically the DLPFC, um, and um, the neural correlates of risk processing, the bilateral insular cortex. And what we see is that with um, in predicting health risk behaviors, we see that the kids that have high executive functioning or high cognitive control and um, high risk processing actually exhibit the lowest amount of health risk behaviors. Um, and we we don't see that in that in the other group. Um, we have not looked at this. We have not looked at cognitive control and social or non-social risk. So I think looking at the interaction between um, this cognitive control system, which has been, uh, is part of the dual systems model of adolescent risky decision-making um, would be really, really interesting. Yeah, that would be really cool to look at cognitive control and social non-social risk in predicting health risk behaviors. Other questions? Anyone? If not, I wanted to thank you, Nina, for a fabulous presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for having me.